you, senior pastor, for this uh, introduction. Actually, you're not supposed to tell anybody. No, I'm just joking. Okay, and a uh, very good morning to all of you, as well as those of you at uh, Suntec. Um, happy Father's Day to all. And um, today we are going to continue our sermon series, Eternity Now, as we study into the book uh, of Revelation. Okay, so today we are going to cover two chapters. Chapter 15 as well as chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. And if you have your Bible with you, I'd like you to encourage you to read from the Word of God. And if you don't, you prefer the video screen, you can look to the big screen. And Revelation chapter 15 verse 1, this is what the Bible says. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels and the seven last plagues. Last, because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked and I saw in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Verse 7, Then one of the four living creatures gave to one of the seven angels seven bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Chapter 16, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it turned into blood like that of a dead person and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in this judgment, O Holy One, you who are and who were. For they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues but they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. But they refused to repent of what they had done. Verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Look, I have come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed, so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bow into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then... 
There came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on people and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was terrible. Wow, Father's Day message. Let us commit this time to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you for your awesome presence here. Lord, we know you are with us. And we pray that God, as we continue this service, your word will speak to us. The Lord, it will not return to you empty, but it will accomplish what you have intended for it to do. And Lord, we ask that you will open up our hearts, you will open up our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears to hear, to see, and to understand your purposes, your intentions, and your love for us. And Lord, if there's somebody here who does not know Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that Lord, you will touch the heart of this person, that Lord, he or she will give his or her life to Jesus Christ this day because this day is the day of their salvation. So Father, we commit this service into your hands. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher. Come and be our counsellor. Come and guide us and let your power and your presence fill this place. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as I was preparing for this weekend's message, you know, I received a, a, an interesting quote from a fellow pastor via WhatsApp. And it was by a very famous preacher called George Whitfield. And he says this, It is a poor sermon that gives no offense, that neither makes the hearer displeased with himself nor with the preacher. So what this means is that, you know, a good sermon will offend you because, you know, it challenges your life. Or it will, it will cause you to be offended about the preacher uh, because what the preacher said, you know, uh, irritated you. So I jokingly um, replied to this fellow pastor and said, okay, noted, I got the message, what do you want me to do this weekend? So whether you will be displeased by this message at the end of the service or not, or whether you'll be displeased with me, the preacher, we will find out in about one and a half hours time. But from this passage we have just read in Revelation 15 and 16, it is very clear that there is someone. Someone was clearly very displeased. Who is this someone? Hello, do you follow me? Yesterday night, same reaction, no? It's like nobody knew what, what, we, were, what, what we have just read. This person is God. God was upset with something, and that's what we're going to study today. That is why my sermon title this morning is The Awesome and Angry God. We are going to study from these two chapters in Revelation 15 and 16 that we've just read, two key characteristics about God and what they mean for us. Okay, we're going to learn two things about God and what they mean for us. It's always going to be challenging to try to explain an infinite God with a finite language, by a finite person, and within a finite time. I'm going to try my best, but I want to remind everyone today, okay, that when we deal with this issue about the character of God, it's going to take a long time, it may even take a lifetime for us to study the character of God. And even more, as we study two very important characteristics about God this morning, Okay, his awesomeness, his anger, and what this means for us. So we shall do that this morning and let's go, okay? So from these two chapters, what we can see about God is that number one, he's an awesome God. And with that, it is a call for us to worship him. And secondly, he is an angry God. With that, it is a call for us to repent and to come to him. We're going to look at them one by one. Firstly, He is an awesome God and He's calling us to worship Him. Now let me begin by first defining the meaning of this word awesome. Because the meaning of this word has faded so much over the years that anything and anyone can be awesome today. For example, you hear of somebody, your friend baked a cake and another friend will say, wow, that's awesome. You baked the cake. Or you will hear of some people saying that, oh, I had ice cream on a very hot day. And someone will say, wow, that's awesome. Or somebody posted a, a, a status update on Facebook and you gathered 150 likes. And then people say, wow, that's an awesome post. 
Or maybe when you come to service and it's a packed service, you found a car park lot. Wow, that's awesome. So everything and anything can be awesome. This word has been used commonly today to mean something that is good, fantastic, or impressive. However, this word awesome was originally used only and exclusively in reference to God. What exactly does this word awesome mean? I'm going to show you the meaning today. Awesome means causing or inducing or inspiring an overwhelming feeling of reverence, admiration or fear produced by that which is grand, sublime, extremely powerful or the like. So I don't know whether you still think that your cake or your Facebook post or your ice cream or your car park lot is awesome. But this is what we are saying of God this morning from these two chapters in Revelation um, 15 and 16. God is awesome and He's calling us to worship Him. Let us first begin by understanding in what ways can we see that God is an awesome God. God is awesome because firstly, He is all-powerful. We have an all-powerful, almighty God. Nothing is impossible for Him. We have just sung this morning. And in chapter 15, we saw this picture of the climax of God's judgment. And we've been studying through the book of Revelation. In the earlier chapters, we have seen the judgment, the, the, the other two cycles of judgment, where we have the seven seals judgment, and then the seven trumpets judgment. And today, we just read the seven bowls judgment. And we see that the power of God being poured out in the earlier chapters was already very amazing, was astounding. But today in Revelation 15 and 16, it, it surpasses all that we have read earlier. Revelation 15 verse 1 says, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels and the seven last plagues. Last, because with them, God's wrath is completed. We see here that finally... Finally, somewhere in the future, there will become a day where the power of God, the wrath of God, the full glory of God is unleashed upon creation. His wrath is completed. The completeness of His wrath also means that His full power was released upon creation as a demonstration of His fury. Now, how different is this full release of His power in this seven bowls judgment compared to the seven trumpets and the seven seals judgment earlier? Now, I'll show you a table and a summary of the comparisons between the three cycles of judgment. Okay, so we will look at the seven seals judgment that we covered in Revelation chapter 6 to 8. And the outcome of that on mankind is that one quarter, okay? Now, not all the seven seals affected mankind, but you know, we, we take the highest one, okay? The greatest impact, one quarter of mankind was affected in the seven seals judgment. And when it came to the seven trumpets judgment in Revelation 8 to 11, one third of mankind was affected. And when we come to the seven bowls judgment in Revelation 15 and 16, you see that all of mankind were affected. In this seven bowl judgment, it is a scary thing because the awesome power of God is revealed. All, of, all the earth was affected, so were the seas, the rivers, the springs, the heavenly bodies, the beast, his kingdom, and the air as well. Where we know the devil operates there as the prince of the powers of the air. And all of mankind were affected in this seven bowls judgment. Sores broke out on all the people. The seas and rivers turned into blood. The sun scorched people and darkness descended. Lightning, rumblings, thunder... And a severe earthquake took place that the Bible described as unprecedented because cities collapsed and large hailstones, 100 pounds one, uh, you know, those are huge, okay? Uh, have you tried to carry weight that are 20 pounds? Imagine 100 pounds hailstone falling from the sky. Such was the power of God. It was so great that Bible tells us that even islands fled. And mountains could no longer be found. Revelation chapter 16 verse 20 says, Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. You could not find those mountains anymore because they ran and hide. Just imagine this. That is, even if you don't believe that those are literal, which I believe they are, even if you don't believe, I tell you the description tells us that it is a very frightening scene. So just imagine this. 
The power of God that's unleashed upon creation. Do you still think your cake is awesome? Your Facebook status is awesome? This is the glimpse of the kind of power that comes in their final judgment in Revelation 15 and 16. So we must understand when we talk about the awesomeness of God, He's an all-powerful God. This is the first point that we must understand as Christians today. When we study the book of Revelation, is that God is telling us, hey people, I am awesome. And that should stir us to worship Him. And that's the first thing, where we see the awesome greatness of God. The second thing is because God is awesome, is because He alone is holy. Only He. Not you, not me. And I'm going to explain that later. Revelation chapter 15 verse 4 says, Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. Alone. No one else comes close. What exactly is the meaning of this word holy? Because many people think that holy means you read the Bible every day. Or you come to church every week and you pray every day. That's holy. You know, I went to church. But what exactly is the meaning of this word holy? To be holy means to be distinct to separate, to cut in a class by oneself. Different, separate, to be totally in a class of its own. When the Bible declares that God is holy, it means that He is distinctively different from human beings. None of us will ever come close to who and where God is. He is separate, He is distinct, He is different from all of us. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2 says this, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. He alone is totally different, distinct from mankind. This is why it is hard to understand God with our human mind, okay? you got to accept this, that when God is in a class of His own and we with our finite mind and we try to understand God, you are not going to find your answer because we are not like Him. We are nowhere near Him. We are, and sometimes when we try and we use our mind to understand God, we fail and our image and impression of God is distorted by our finite mind. If your mind today can understand God, eh, you may, that means that oh, nothing that God does surprises you or you got it figured out or everything about God. His personality, His nature, His person, the way He works, then I want to congratulate you because your mind have kind of enveloped God, can fully explain God, and God doesn't surprise you anymore. Your mind is actually the new God. And you should take out your brain and start to worship the brain. Because there is no way that a finite mind can ever understand God. Let me try to explain eh, this, this thing about trying to understand something infinite with something that is finite. So we will go for a max lesson, mathematics lesson. When you have one number that is divided by a big number, what do you get? For example, one divided by 10, what do you get? Okay, 0 0.1, okay? And if you get one divided by one, what is the result? One. Okay, so you notice that the, the bigger the denominator, okay, the smaller number at the base, okay, what will you get? A smaller number. But when the... When the denominator becomes smaller, for example, when 1 is divided by 0 0.1, your answer is 10. Still follow or not? Okay, can I? When you get 1 divided by 0, what is the answer you're supposed to get? Infinity. Very good. Okay. Well, last night nobody dared to reply. This scared is wrong. They, stick, they are very worried because many preachers like to trick them. Okay, but 1 divided by 0 is infinity because why? When you have 1 divided by a very, very small number, as the number becomes smaller and smaller, your, your result, right, your answer gets bigger and bigger until it becomes infinity. Many, many numbers that you can place behind. So let me ask you a question, okay? Now that you have this number called infinity, if you get infinity and then you get infinity plus 1, which one is bigger? Infinity plus 1 is bigger or is infinity bigger? How many of you say infinity plus 1 is bigger? Put up your hand. Hey, come on, be bold and courageous. Okay, very good. Huh? All of you are wrong. The moment you think like that, it means you did not understand the meaning of this word 
infinity. There is no such thing as infinity plus one. There is no such thing as infinity plus three is bigger than infinity plus two. Because if you say that, it means that you have no idea what is the beginning state of this thing called infinity. I believe that some of you are getting the point. This is also the reason why when we try to understand an infinite God, you can never reach there. Because it's hard for us with our finite mind to understand this thing. While you just have to accept it, there's no such thing as infinity plus three or infinity plus two. Infinity means infinity. There is nothing such as that. So we must understand when we come to God, our mind can never fully understand God. Let alone try to explain Him. And our human language will never be sufficient. You can never find the right word to fully explain God. Even this word awesome is not awesome enough. But still, we need to try and know more about God. The key to God's eternal glory and His power is in His holiness. His glory is not just His strength, nor His power, but also His perfect and moral character. The perfection of God. He will never do anything that's morally wrong. He is not just all powerful. He will not abuse his power. He will use his power correctly, justly, and righteously. This is out of his holy character. Perfect. First John chapter 1, verse 5 tells us this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you: God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Everything God does is perfect. There is no darkness, not even one speck of imperfection in God. He's in a class of His own, separate from us. For many of us, we still have some darkness in us. And some of us have more darkness than other people. Or a lot of darkness. But Psalm 92 verse 15 continues to prove to us, proclaiming the Lord is upright, He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in Him. In God, there is no trace of evil or darkness or wickedness in His character. That's why He is holy. There, he alone is holy. There is none that can compare to Him. There is none who is like Him. That's why our God is awesome and it should inspire us to worship Him. Everything He does is good even when we don't understand. He does not participate in any sin nor is He capable of any sin. In fact, this this trait about the holiness of God is the only trait about God that when it's mentioned, okay, it's repeated, highlighted three times, twice in the whole Bible, and it's always about what happened in heaven. When somebody saw an image of a revelation or a vision of heaven, when they try to describe what they saw about God, this word is used, and this word is not just used, it is repeated three times. Let's look at Revelation chapter 4 verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This same verse, okay, this same mention, this three words, holy, 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 was also repeated in Isaiah chapter 6. And the famous preacher R.C. Sproul makes the following observation. He said this, The Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. Not that He is merely holy or even holy, holy. Two times, huh? He is holy, holy, holy. Three times. The Bible never says that God is love, 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 or mercy, 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 or wrath, 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 or justice, justice, justice. It does say that He is holy, holy. Holy, holy, and the whole earth is full of His glory. This tells us that the divine nature of the holiness of God is not to be missed. It is very important to our understanding about God. And it must inspire us to know about how awesome this God is. So today I want to tell you that even when God does things that you may not understand, just like infinity plus three, you cannot understand. You just must accept that infinity means infinity. And when we say that God is a holy God, He will never do anything wrong. He will never do anything that is bad. Even when you look around you, you can't explain everything. I want to tell you, God is separate. He's distinct. He's holy. And His ways are higher than our ways. And that 
is the reason why He's an awesome God and we must worship Him. So even when we don't understand things, we must know that out of His perfection, His holy and moral character, the problem will never be found in God. The problem has to be found in our understanding about who God is. And when we are finite and we try to explain an infinite God, that's where words will fail, answers will fail. Today, I hope that you understood how awesome God is. God is awesome because number one, He is all-powerful. And secondly, He alone is holy. And the response we have in view of the, of the awesomeness of God is to worship Him. Psalm 29 verse 2 says this, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. This was exactly what happened in Revelation chapter 15 verse 4. It says, Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. When we see the holiness of God, His righteous acts, they are demonstrated, it inspires worship. Because the awesome character of God is found in His holiness. When the Israelites were delivered from the bondage of Egypt, they sang the song of Moses. Okay, when we read Revelation chapter 15, you, you hear this mention of the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Now in Revelation 15, when the people of God who were victorious, they stood. It was another kind of sea. It's no longer the Red Sea. It was a sea of glass. And what did they do? They worshipped the awesome God who delivered them from the beast and the mark of the beast. Revelation 15 verse 2 to 3 says, And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. At the final deliverance of God's people. You know, the Old Testament is always a shadow of what is to come. When the people of Israel were delivered from the bondage of Egypt, there was a time when they came to this Red Sea and they couldn't cross. The Egyptians were pursuing them. What did God do? God demonstrated His power. God demonstrated His character. He opened up the Red Sea. They crossed over on dry land. When they reached the other side, what happened? The water came back and drowned the Egyptians. The Israelites were delivered. And in the book of Revelation chapter 15, we saw the same thing repeated. God is telling us that He's going to pour His power again. One more time. When we stand at the sea of glass, what is God going to do? He's going to demonstrate His power again. The same way He delivered the Egypt. Deliver the Israelite from the Egyptians, he's going to deliver his people from the mark of the beast, from the mark, from the beast himself, and from all the deception in the world in the last days. That will be the final deliverance through the power of God and because of the character of God. Now, if we really understand how awesome God is, how great he is, we will have no problem to worship him. Amen? So I always hear this thing about, oh, you know, when it comes to worship, I can't sing this song because, you know, this is uh, too fast for me, too young for me. You know, some of them say, oh, this song is, uh, I, I'm the one that, you know, I sing the slower song, the hymns. Um, can you imagine, if you believe the biblical account, human history is maybe six to 7,000 years. Uh, when we all go to heaven, what song will we sing? Uh? Because there's four, uh, six to 7,000 years of genres of song to choose from. Can you imagine the mess that we will have when we go to heaven and we try to select a worship song? I want to tell you this morning that worship is never about the song. Worship is about the object of our worship. Do you know that the four creatures only had one verse lyrics? Day and night, they repeated the same verse. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That should let you know the awesomeness of God. If you understand the meaning of the word, 
if you understand the character and the nature of God, you will never find it difficult to worship God. No matter what you're going through, you can still worship Him. It is a call to worship when we understand that God is a holy God. That's the first thing we can learn from Revelation 15 and 16. The second thing we can learn is that God, we can see that God is not just an awesome God. He's calling us to worship Him. He is also an angry God. He's calling us to repent. Repent from our sins. He's telling the world, repent. I'm coming and there will be a final time. I'm going to pour out my wrath on this Father's Day. You are not here by accident. Your heavenly Father is crying out to you. Repent. Come back to me. Don't run away from me. I don't know whether in your life you have ever seen somebody who is so angry, so mad, that he wants to destroy everything in the house. Maybe some of you say, yeah, yeah, yeah that's me. Okay, then later you come for ministry. So what, there was one time I was so angry, I want to smash up everything in the house. I want to smash the washing machine, the refrigerator, my TV, my guitar, everything. Have you ever seen people like that? They are so angry, they are so mad that they want to destroy something and they want to destroy everything. Maybe when they, when they destroy something expensive, they will stop. Okay, if your TV costs $6,000, I'm quite sure when you destroy that $6,000, suddenly you realize, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But here in Revelation chapter 16, we see a very drastic image of God. Normally, God doesn't get that mad. He doesn't get that angry that He came to a point He wanted to destroy the whole of creation. But in Revelation 15 and 16, that's exactly God, what He wanted to do. He said, this is it. Enough is enough. Too much already. This is the peak of the wrath of God, the fury, the anger of God. Revelation 15 verse 1 says, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last. Why last? Because with them, God's wrath is completed. God's eternal reign cannot start until all of evil is completely destroyed. As long as there is the presence of evil, it stirs up the wrath of God. And finally, in Revelation chapter 16, we saw, and 15 and 16, we saw that the time has finally come for God to say what? It is it. Finished. I'm going to, keep, I'm going to put an end to all the evil in my creation. Every and all of evil must end at that final judgment. In fact, this wrath of God had to be completed. If not, nobody is allowed to enter the temple in heaven. Revelation 15 verse 8 says this, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. God has never, okay, He has seldom got so angry, but this was the final moment. And I want to tell you this morning, if you don't want to come to this day in Revelation 15 and 16, where you face the wrath of God that all His fury is upon mankind, today respond to the call in repentance. And unfortunately, from the passage we have just read, this was not the response of the people living in those times. Revelation 16 verse 9 says, they were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify Him. They refused to answer the call to repentance. They refused to answer the call to worship. They refused to glorify God. Despite the awesome power of God that was displayed, despite the anger of God that is unleashed, Revelation chapter 16, verse 10 to 11 says, People gnaw their tongues in agony and they cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. These people were hurting. Their tongues were already hurting. And what did they do? They still cursed God. In spite of their pain in their tongues, that is how rebellion, that is how defiant they were. They even waged war against God they joined the demons and they tried to fight against God. Revelation 16 verse 14 says, They are demonic spirits that perform signs and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. This is the sad response that the people in those days have. They still refuse to repent and turn from their sin to call upon God. Even after the final seventh bowl, okay, after six bowls have been you know, 
unleashed upon them. The people rejected the call of God to repent. They cursed God. And instead of bowing to Him in awe, in worship and repentance, we see what they do. Verse 21 says, From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on people and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. They just continued, even though the seventh and the final bow was unleashed. There are a lot of people who, who come to God and say this, you know, Hey God, if you are real, uh, if you appear, uh, I will believe in you. I want to tell you from the from Bible, it's not necessarily true. Those people have already gone through the seven seals, the seven trumpets, you know. Um, uh, they, they've seen the seven bowls, at least six bowls. At the seventh bowl, they still refused. They continue to curse God. So I want to tell you today that it's not necessarily true that when you see a miracle, people will believe in God. You know, the people who crucified Jesus, are these the people who didn't see miracles? No. These were the same people that saw Jesus feed the 5,000, raise the day, walk on water. They were the ones that crucified Jesus. So please don't think that just because you see a miracle, you will automatically believe in God. Maybe it's easier for you to believe in God, but it's not necessarily something that's automatic. So don't be surprised if there are defiant people, if there are people around you that no matter what miracles have happened around them, despite the awesome display of God's power, despite the fact that His anger is going to come one day, there will be people who will stand in defiance and they will not repent. I want to tell you today that God's anger reveals the holiness of God. It also reveals the hardness of hearts among the unrepentant. So one of the purpose of the anger and the fury and the wrath of God is to display His holy character. A holy God must punish sin. And at the same time, the purpose of anger and wrath of God is to reveal who are the unrepentant ones. Who are the ones who after seeing all this will refuse to bow their knees, refuse to worship God. So don't be surprised that many will refuse to repent even when God's anger and judgment are foolish, un fully unleashed upon them. God's anger, His fury will reveal the hearts of men. I've heard many people ask many questions. When I, before I became a, a, a Christian, I was anti-Christianity. I asked a lot of tough questions and most Christians cannot answer. And uh, today I hope I try uh, okay, to answer some of these tough questions I used to ask and so one of the very common ones is this. People say, oh, I, I don't believe in God. I don't believe that God is good because if God is good, why then didn't He do anything about the evil around us? Heard this before? Very common. I, I, you say what? Christian God, God is good. No, 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 God, God lousy. If God, God is good, how come there's famine, there's children dying, there's all these things? And they always say, oh, I don't believe that God is good. Because if God is good, He would not allow evil around us. I want to tell you something. Number one, it is not true that God does not do anything about the evil around us. He already had a plan. Do you realize that? Revelation 15 and 16 is the plan. Hello? That one day God is going to put a final judgment and all of evil is, will be destroyed completely through and through. All of evil will be removed. This is the day of the seven bowls judgment. It is the day He will destroy all evil we see around us. So who said that he didn't want to do something about it? He might not do it now, but that does not mean that he won't do it. So the question is maybe, oh pastor, okay, I can accept that maybe God has a plan. In fact, I want to tell you this plan that he has, uh, he had it from the very beginning. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, what did he say? He says the offspring of the woman is going to crush a serpent on the head, although the serpent was going to strike the heel, the seed of woman is going to crush the devil on his head. That that was at creation, you know, before you were born, before you had the right to ask this question, God already said He has a plan. So please don't say that God didn't have a plan to address evil. He has. Your question maybe should be, why take so long? Okay, God, yeah, I know you have a plan, but wow, come on, six to 7,000 years already, you know? Why so long? God, why do you take so long? I want to tell you the answer is because God is indeed a good God and that's why He's taking so long. He's not like us, remember human beings. He is holy, whereas we are not. He is separate from us. He is beyond and above us. We human beings get angry very quickly and easily. Amen? Don't believe, uh, you're not that one, right? 
I'm quite sure, but I'm going to challenge you. Eh? When your spouse forget to do something for, nice for you, for example, today Father's Day, never, no dinner tonight, no surprises, will you feel upset? Or if, if um, your cell leader didn't greet you, greet everybody in the cell, forgot about you. No birthday greetings. Do you get upset? Today, this morning, you came in, the usher didn't give you the bulletin. Do you get upset? Or when you are waiting for your favorite car park lot or the favorite seat in the auditorium, someone sat there or someone took your parking lot because you've been waiting there for quite some time. The moment somebody comes out, boom, another car goes in. Do you get upset immediately? I'm quite sure no, lah, no, because just now nobody admitted. For those who drive in Singapore, when you are in your lane and there's a gap in front, eh, and somebody sickness, what do you do? You of course step on your brake, you know, let the person have more space come in, right? Yes, I don't believe you. <laughs> you will prepare to horn that person or high beam, prepare your high beam. You will speed up and when the person finally squeeze in, what do you do? You high beam and horn as if it is the day of judgment. That's the problem with us human beings. We get angry very easily, very quickly, but God is a holy God. He's not like you. He does not get angry so quickly. If the waiter or waitress don't serve us, delay your order. Some of us, hey, hello, hey, I order first, you know. How come the other person get it before me? We're very impatient, no? And we tend to think of God's anger and His judgment as somewhat similar. God should be like me. He should get angry. He should settle evil today. He should punish the evil right now. How can He allow this to continue? We want evil to be punished immediately because that is something that you and I would do. And we expect God to be like you and I to punish evil immediately, right now. But God is a holy God. He's separate. He's in a class of His own. The Bible has this to say about God. This God that is so awesome. This God that gets angry, yes, but that's what the Bible says about Him in Psalm 103 verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. The Bible says God is slow to anger, not like us. That when somebody does something, we expect that judgment, the evil to be unleashed immediately, but God is not like us. He is slow to anger. He is a holy God. That is why God's judgment and our anger does not come immediately when we sin. Those, for those of us who have been Christians for quite some time, eh, you know you're not supposed to sin, right? You know, right? I hope you know. No? Do you still sin sometimes? Yes. If you say no, you have just sinned. You still sin sometimes and do you find that God's judgment comes immediately every time you sin? You realize that it's not. There is always, you know, some reminders. You will read the Bible and then, you know, the Holy Spirit begins to convict you, to speak to you, ask you to repent, confess, go and say sorry to your husband, go and say sorry to your wife and you will try to resist it. You say, oh, do not let the sun go down on my anger. I still have five more hours before sunset. You see, God is really slow to anger. He abounds in love. He's inviting the people to repentance, to turn back from their sins, to come towards God. From our own Christian journey, you understand that God is indeed a good God. He is slow to anger. And if you study the nation of Israel, the history of the nation of Israel, you will know that when they walked away from God and when they sinned against God, what did God do? God sent many prophets. God sent many warnings, keep telling them, hey, don't do this. If you do this, that is going to happen. Please don't do that. You know how long did that journey take? Centuries before they finally went to exile after many generations of idolatry. That's how slow God's judgment is. He can wait for years before the final judgment comes upon any one of us. Why? Why is he slow to judge evil? Because he's giving us time to repent. And he's giving creation, the whole of mankind, thousands of years to repent. So never come and say that God is an evil God. In your understanding, just because he doesn't punish evil immediately, you say that God is not a good God. That's because your finite mind is trying to understand an infinite God. You can't. 
So God delays judgment because He is slow to anger. He is a good God. And if judgment comes earlier, it is usually to prevent more evil from being done later. Some people, because if you read today's living life, uh, I think it's quite amazing, okay? None of this is coordinated, it's planned. The reason why God has to judge certain kings earlier is because why? These people, if you don't judge them, wow, they're going to do worse damage than before. So you must understand that God always has a plan and His plan is always good. God's desire is that first choice, He doesn't have to judge people but He gives them the chance to repent. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8-9 to nine says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why does God allow evil? Because some of these evil people today, they are going to repent. They're going to repent some days. And why is God telling us in Revelation 15 and 16, there is one final judgment coming from the seven bowl judgment. Is that He's calling out to mankind that before that day comes, now is the time for you to repent. Today, if you are sitting here, you do not know Jesus Christ. Today, God is calling out to you on Father's Day. Come back. Because my heart for you is that none should perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is patiently waiting for more people to come to repentance before He destroys the whole of creation. Unfortunately and sadly, many people have rejected and they pass on into eternity without accepting this call to repentance. A thousand years are like a day to the Lord. A day is like a thousand years to God. Human beings cannot say this. Uh. Even if you say you live to 100 years, uh, you, you can't say this statement. No. Oh, uh, to me, uh, a day is like a 100 years. Uh, you only have one day in your life. Then one and a half day later, you probably will be gone already. But that is the patience, the long-suffering, the love of God. God is patiently waiting for everyone to come back so that we need not face His final wrath and anger. But there will be those unrepentant ones and God's final judgment will reveal the condition of their hardened hearts. I also want to say, say this. Uh, for people who say, oh, you know, if God is good, uh, you know, why does he do anything about evil? Do you know what that statement means or not? That statement basically means that God has to do something to you as well. When you are asking God, God, why don't you judge evil? Okay, God says, okay, today I fast forward the clock. Today is judgment day. You know what God has to do? God has to judge you because why? You are the evil person also. So do you know, do you understand when you ask that question, God, why do you allow evil? You are asking God, why is God allowing you to stay alive when He should have judged you because you are also the evil person? Perhaps the question we need to ask is not why God hasn't judged evil. You should ask yourself, why hasn't God judged you? Because you're part of the evil. I, am, I was part of that evil, I know. I'm very honest. Uh. I used to be a terrible person, very rude. Or maybe still is sometimes, sometimes. Less, very much less nowadays. But if really God were to judge today, all of us deserve to be judged. Unless you have the blood of Jesus Christ covering you. And God says what? Pass over. Because why? The blood of Jesus is upon you. And some of us need to understand, when you ask that kind of question, when you are not a believer, you ask that question, you are basically asking God to judge you. And God does not want to judge you now. He wants to give you a chance to repent so that you need not face His anger. God's anger and judgment has one aim. Eh? One of the aims that God has in His judgment is to turn us back to Him and He withholds them intentionally. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11 says, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? That is the cry of God's heart today as well. He's not just crying out to the people of Israel, He's crying out to all His children today on Father's Day. Turn! Why do you have to die? I take no delight in the death of the wicked. God wants us to live. So God's anger and the human anger are different. 
God's anger in judgment are just, righteous, perfect. Our human anger, most of the time, if we are honest enough, our anger is a spontaneous kind of anger. Suddenly, you get angry already. Today, you are in a bad mood. Not enough sleep. Wow, you get angry more easily. Aircon breakdown. Singapore climate very hot. Right? You also get hotter. And most of the time, our anger is in retaliation to something that people have done. When somebody steals your wallet, you get upset, right? Oh, I'm going to catch a, call the police and catch a thief. But when the thief steals someone else's wallet, you don't care. Oh, it's not my wallet. No need to punish. That sin, no need to punish. But why oh, you steal my wallet? Cannot. Must make police report. Everybody cannot go home. Huh? We'll search your bag today. Our anger, our judgment is a very selfish kind of judgment. But God is a holy God. His anger, His wrath is a righteous wrath and anger. Revelation chapter 16, verse 5 says, Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, O Holy One, you who are and who were. That is the power, that's the righteousness of God. God is an angry God, but why He does that is because He's a just God. He makes no mistakes with His judgment. Verse 7 of chapter 16 says, And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, True and just are your judgments. When God punish, He's righteous, He's just. I've heard another question, very common one. What about the good people? Somewhere in the mountains, but they never had the opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ. How will God judge them? How do you think God will judge them? God is a righteous and just God. God will judge them righteously and justly. Please don't worry about those good people. If they really do exist, there is really one or two or hundred or thousands of good people around the world, you don't worry about them. They, if they are good, they are also not worried because they are good. What? They don't worry about judgment because they know they are good. You need to wonder whether you are that good person or not. Are you that good person who is sinless? Never once in your life have you committed one sin. Never. Never selfish one time. Never score a word of vulgarity one time. Never. Never one. Maybe you should come and preach now. <laughs> the only person I've known is Jesus Christ. There is no, no one else on earth who can call themselves good. But you don't have to worry. In case there is, that we don't know, huh? well, we don't know everything, but in case there is, hey, don't worry. God says what? His judgments are right. He's, they are just. He never make mistakes. We sometimes make mistakes. Human judges make mistakes. Why? Because based on what evidence you present. Uh, the judge doesn't know everything. Based on evidence, okay, I think you're guilty, you're not guilty. But our God, I'm so sorry to say this, you know, He's perfect. He knows everything. He knows everything about you all the time. Not just when you're in church. When you're in church, people ask you, hey, how are you doing? Ah? Oh, great, bro. Great pastor. Doing well. At home fighting with the wife or you're fighting with the husband. Everything okay? No? Okay, okay. You can bluff me. You can bluff yourself, leaders. But God knows. And maybe you're here, you're not a Christian. The same thing I'll say to you. On the outside, you look okay. You are a good person to us. But to God, are you a good person? Because God knows your thoughts. God knows and sees you when no one else is there, when you're all alone by yourself. So don't worry about a good person. Don't worry about how God will judge a good person. He's perfect, He's holy, He's just, He's righteous. He can't, He will never make a mistake. And because He's perfect, He will also not make a mistake when it comes to you. If you are not good, God will have to say you are not good because He's a just God. If you even have committed just one sin in your life, a holy God must unleash His anger on you. And there will come a day in Revelation 15 and 16 where this anger is not just unleashed upon you, it's unleashed upon all of creation. God is telling you, don't wait for that day. God is showing us His anger is a call to repentance. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And for any one of us who have sinned against God or against another person, you already are on the pathway. Your penalty is death. You cannot save yourself anymore. You are no longer qualified to save yourself. 
You have to find somebody who is sinless. Then that person can die on your behalf to pay the penalty of death on your behalf on your sin. Unfortunately, there's no second human being on earth that is sinless except for Jesus Christ. That's why He is qualified. He alone is worthy to die in our place. And He's asking you today, would you accept this gift? Human beings don't like the idea of judgment because we think that, we don't think it is fair for someone to judge another person because we think that there could be reasons or there could be uh, mitigating factors that were not taken into consideration. But I want to tell you today, God is a righteous God. God is a just God. God is a holy God. He knows everything all the time. He will not make a mistake. He will know how to judge every single one of us. And the sad reality is, if we are honest with ourselves, we deserve death a thousand times. But yet, that is not God's desire for us. His wrath is to reveal to us our need for a Savior. Psalm 145 verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways, faithful in all He does. He's a faithful God, righteous. God's final judgment in Revelation 16 with the seven bowls is to tell us enough with evil. The time is up. Verse 6 says, For they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. God's judgment is righteous. And verses 9 to 11 says, When he opened the fifth seal of Revelation chapter 6, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. These people, they cry out, in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them were given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. These martyrs asked God, How long? The saints cry out in Revelation 6, How long, God, are you going to avenge the blood? Are you going to allow evil to continue? God says, just a little while longer. Why? Why? There's a group of people that needs to die first. Martyrs who are called by God, chosen to shed blood for Him. Why are they shedding blood? Because they are preaching the gospel. So that more people can be saved. But God says, enough. Enough suffering in the world, enough starvation, enough terror, enough death, enough indignity, enough lives trapped in hopelessness and bondage, enough sicknesses, enough time, enough opportunities, enough chances to repent. When it comes to Revelation 16, he says, enough. Just a little while longer. That time is running out on us. In 1981, an American radio station reported a story about a stolen car in California. The police were staging an intense search for the car thief, for this vehicle and the thief that's inside. Okay, even to the point of placing announcements on raid, local radio stations to try to locate this thief. Why? Because in the front seat of this car that the thief has stolen, the owner of the car, he had put a box of biscuit there and the problem is that this box of biscuit had red poison on it because the owner of the car wanted to use that as a bait for rats, to kill rats. But because the biscuit were left in the front seat, they were very concerned that the car thief would take the biscuit and start to eat them. So the car owner and the police had intended to rescue him. They were trying to locate the driver, the thief of this car who is running away further and further, faster and faster. They were trying to save him and yet he was trying to running away. He was running away from the people who were trying to save him. So often the same thing happens to us. We run from God thinking that we want to escape his punishment. You are not, you are not running away from his punishment. You are actually running away from his rescue. He is trying to rescue you and you are trying to run away from His rescue. God's wrath is meant to save us. To remind us there is a judgment coming, don't go there. It is a call to repentance. 
God is an awesome God. He's calling us to worship Him. And God is an angry God. He's calling us to repent of our sins. I'm quite sure there will be people here, whether you are here in Marine Parade or over there in Suntec, you do not know Jesus Christ. Today, I want to give you a chance, an opportunity to say yes to God. In a moment's time, I'm going to help you. I'm going to pray a prayer that is specially designed for people like you who either have never prayed to receive Christ or you have been a Christian but you ran away from God. Today, you want to come back to Him on Father's Day. I want to give you an opportunity. So all over this place, as well as at Suntech, can I invite all of us to bow our heads and close our eyes? If you have never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior or you have walked away from Him, I'm going to pray this prayer. This prayer is designed to invite Jesus to come into your life. I'm going to pray one line and I want to invite you to follow me line by line, word for word, and you mean it in your heart. And all the Christians will join in together with you so that you do not feel shy. So if you are ready to invite Jesus Christ into your life to be your personal Lord and Savior, follow me in this word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying for me on the cross. I recognize I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I cannot save myself. I want to invite you to come into my heart right now. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a child of God. Make me a child of God. I want to surrender my life to you. I want to surrender my life to you. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, be my savior. Be my savior. Be my master. Be my master. Be my lord. Be my lord. I pray this in your precious name. I pray this in your precious name. As all his remember, all eyes closed. If you have followed me in a word of prayer, I want to pray for you. And in order for me to do that, nobody looking around except for some people who are on duty. When I count to three, I'd like to invite you to put up your hand high up. When you put up your hand, you're saying to me, Pastor Wee Long, I prayed to receive Christ. Or I want to receive Christ. Even if you didn't follow me in that word of prayer, but you want to receive Jesus Christ into your heart. As I count to three, raise up your hands. You don't need to open up your eyes and look around. Just at the count of three, put your hands high up so that I can see you and I can pray for you. I'm going to count right now. One, two, three. Lift up your hand. Hallelujah, brother. Hallelujah, sister. I see those hands. Suntec City, are there? Yes, I see those hands at Suntec as well. Are there more? Do not let this chance pass you by. Do not let the anger of the Lord come upon you. Today is the day that He's calling you to repent. Father, I thank you, God, for all these hands that are raised. Thank you, Lord. Because, God, you see the cries of their heart. Lord, they are accepting and calling out to you for your mercy, for your grace. And, Lord, your intention is for none to perish but for all to come to repentance. And Lord, you will welcome them. Today, they have become your sons and your daughters. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Can I invite all of us to stand to our feet? Hallelujah. Come on, let's give praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. There are some hands that were raised. And this is what we're going to do. We're gonna, we want you to come forward to make a public declaration for the Lord. Okay, so I'm going to count to three one more time. And if you have prayed that prayer with me, you have put up your hand, or you didn't do all this, but you want to give your life to Jesus. Or maybe during the week, okay, in a cell meeting or in an outreach activity or in a project conquest uh, um, cell, you gave your life to Jesus. Okay, we want the whole church to pray for you. Okay, so at the count of three, take all your belongings and come to the front to my right, which is your left. The whole church want to welcome you. Okay, church, are you ready to welcome the, the, the new people? Are you ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah. Bring your belongings and come to the front. Even up there in the balcony, we'll wait for you. Just come down. Come down and give your life to Jesus. Church, if you have brought a friend this morning, why don't you turn to the friend and ask, hey, I think you should consider giving your life to Jesus. If you want to go forward, I will go with you. Just come. Hallelujah. Are there more? I believe there are some people who are too shy to come out. Don't worry, this is a family. We want to really pray for you. Just come out and leave your seat. But I want to congratulate those of you who have already come forward, you know, over here in Marine Parade as well as over there at Suntech City. I want to tell you this is the best decision you have ever made in your life. 
Today, the God, the creator of the universe, heavens and the earth, He heard your prayer and He has become your heavenly Father. So I want the whole church to stretch forward our hands to pray for them. Lord, we thank you for all this, your children, Lord, your sons and daughters. Today, Lord, as they have opened up their hearts to receive you as their personal Lord and Saviour, Lord, we declare that, Lord, in the name of Jesus, their sins are forgiven. Their names are written in the book of life. Father, their spirit man is born again. Lord, today, Father, you have become their God their Lord, their Master. And Father, they will sense your presence. In the days ahead, they are going to grow from strength to strength. And Lord, we pray for their families as well that one by one, they will come to know Jesus Christ. Because God, your blessings, your presence, your faithfulness will be with them all the days of their life. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 God bless you. Can I invite you to follow our pastor to a room outside where we want to continue to help you in this journey to know the Lord. I want to report something to all of us that today as we learn about the fact that God is an awesome God we need to worship Him that God is an angry God He's calling us to repent Church we are entering a time where we're going to be sent out as missionaries for a day and I know that there are some people who are extremely fearful extremely frightened it's as if you don't know that your God is awesome that He's not going to be with you. You're going to be there on your own. No, I tell you, God is going to be with you. Yesterday, we had four groups of pastors who went out for three hours. Sorry, how many? Eight groups, okay. Eight groups of people that went out. They preached for three hours on the street. 29 people gave their life to Jesus. Don't be afraid our God is an awesome God. Worship Him by going out in faith. Don't just worship Him and sing songs. That's very easy. Worship Him and go outside. Go out there and tell people our God is an awesome God. He is calling us back to Him. And today, if there's fear in your heart and you say, Oh man, I'm not sure whether I can do that. I want to give you an opportunity to come to the front and ask God for a faith that He's awesome. That when you go in the name of the Lord, signs and wonders will follow you. You're going to pray for people who are sick and they will see healing in the streets. Just like the book of Acts. So we will open the time to minister to people. I know time is running by, but let's minister to the Lord. Let's be ministered by God because I know that God wants to do healing. So if there's an issue that you need to repent, you know, there's some words that are released here. People need to repent because you love the praises of men more than the praises of God. In fact, I want to tell you that you are more fearful of men than you fear the Lord. You need to come forward and repent. Do you know that sometimes we can limit the glory of God by the way we live? We limit we limit God, we limit the awesomeness of God by our fear. You don't dare to go out, God's awesome power cannot be displayed. And if you are that person this morning, I want to challenge you to say, I've never done this in my life before. I want to try one time. I'm going to believe God for something. So as we worship the Lord, the altar is open at Sunday as well. Come and respond. Come and worship the awesome God. Come and repent in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that you are our heavenly Father. That Lord, you are an awesome Father who loves us and you are slow to anger and full of compassion. Lord, your love for us is new. Your mercies are new every morning. Lord, let there be a new revelation of the greatness of your love of your power and of your person in every one of our lives this morning. That God, our finite mind can catch a glimpse of how great you are. And the Lord, we will never be afraid to proclaim to others how great thou art. Amen. So Father, bless your people. And if anybody here, they are afraid to stand in the street to preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I break the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. Lord, I declare that the presence of God will go before them, will go with them, and the Lord's signs and wonders will follow them. 
that as they stand in the streets, they will sense the presence of God. And Lord, you are going to use them to minister your power, your love, Lord, to the lost. And we are going to see a mighty harvest, Lord, as we participate in these missionaries for a day. Yes. So Lord, let the presence of God go with us. And the Lord, as leaders and members go back to their cell, they will be excited. They will say, let's believe God for something. So Father, let there be an impartation of faith. And Lord, let the manifested glory of God be upon your children. Because God, you are our great and awesome Father in heaven. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. And see you next week. The rest of you who are being ministered to can still remain at the front as the rest of us quickly make our way out, you know, so that the next service can begin. The Lord bless you.